I am so happy to see everybody here today. Thank you. I know it's a little rainy out. Thank you for taking the time to come to our little mealtime meeting. We'll give it just a, one more minute and then we will get started. And this is our first ever Beyond the Nest Caregiver Virtual Training Series. This particular presentation is going to talk about how to strengthen mealtime and different mealtime challenges that we may be experiencing, uh, tips, things we can do to help. And as we go through the presentation, if anything stands out to anybody, I encourage you to use the chat. Feel free to type something in the chat box, say, oh my gosh, me too. <laughs> or, huh, I never thought of that before. This is a great opportunity for you as parents and caregivers to connect with one another. Maybe you might find you are having similar struggles as another family and you could try and help each other out. I always encourage parents to connect with each other, especially on mealtime. All right. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I wanted to run through the table of contents really quickly. The whole presentation today should take about 25 minutes, give or take. We're gonna go over some learning objectives. I'll do a quick introduction of myself. We're gonna look at some national standards for recommendations for mealtime and food in general. We're gonna go through the food groups, the energy, the meals and snacks. We're gonna review a woman named Ellen Satter. She is someone that we you refer to very frequently, especially at Bluebird. We're gonna go through the roles of caregivers and children. And we're gonna be finding ways to fit these recommendations and guidelines into your routines at home. At the end, we'll review learning objectives and we'll go over any questions that you might have throughout the presentation. I couldn't resist a good cat gift, so thank you all for indulging me here. <laughs> if you do have a question, feel free to put it in the chat Zoom box. I can't promise I will see it as you're typing it. Sometimes I have to just go through the presentation. So what would help me is if you were able to list the slide number that you have a question about and then insert your question and I'm happy to refer back to the presentation so we can all go through it once more. But again, we'll probably save questions for the end, but feel free to write them in the comments as we're going through the presentation. I promise I will get to them all at the end. All right, so a little bit about me. <laughs> My name is Audrey. I am a registered dietitian. I am licensed in the state of Illinois. I'm also a behavioral therapist. I have been with Bluebird Day since 2017. Personally, my favorite food is pasta, always has been, and I'm pretty sure always will be. And actually one of my earliest food memories was eating a tomato from the kitchen counter thinking it was a piece of watermelon. And much to my surprise, <laughs> it was not watermelon. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I avoided tomatoes for a couple of years after that. It really stuck with me. And one of my favorite things to do is walk my dog, that's her pictured there, Ginger, <laughs> and sometimes she likes to sneak her way up onto the couch without being invited. <laughs> One of my main uh, positions here at Bluebird is actually to offer nutrition services. If you haven't heard already, nutrition services can be directed at your child, so working one-on-one, -on -one, or they can happen through your family. So direct services can be worked into your child's day if you were interested in focusing a little more on their nutrition or their eating or their intake or mealtime goals that you may have. We can work these in through extended day services that'll happen before or after your child's rotations. These can happen individually and in a group. We may be able to work it out in a group right now, obviously COVID is pre presenting quite a few restrictions on how many kiddos we can have in the center at one time, but they're just a few options for you. Family services typically happen virtually now. They can happen either before or after your child's Bluebird Day. And they typically happen in your home or in a caregiver's home, somewhere that the kiddo spends quite a bit of time. Below you see here are some examples of when we could fit nutrition therapy into your child's day. If you are a PM kiddo with 
services happening down here. We can fit your sessions in in the morning at home and one of the options right here, or we can fit them in between the hours of five and six. And flip-flop that, if you are an AM family, your kiddo can come in between the hours of seven and eight. We could potentially work on breakfast together if that was a goal that you might that you had. And then your child would go to rotations and then they would come home and there is a chance to work on nutrition therapy in your home between the hours of one and uh, five going till about six. So if you have any questions, feel free to let me know and you can always contact me. There's my email there or you can reach out to our scheduling department or give them a call. So our learning objectives here, we're going to be talking about the adult roles and the child roles at mealtime. There are three and two respectively. You're going to identify the amount of meals and snacks recommended per day and you're going to want to name at least three things other than appetite that contribute to your child's ability to eat. These are things that I want you to keep track of as we're going through and we're going to review them at the end. So when we look at mealtime, the big question is, what does my child need? And I am going to give you the timeless public health general answer of <laughs> it depends. It does depend. It depends on your child's age, their sex at birth, their activity level, any diets, allergies, or intolerances that we may be working with. And of course, at any point in time, if you feel like your child is really struggling with mealtime at home and there's something medically that could be going on, please contact your child's pediatrician and make sure you let them know if they're going on any new diets or if you're trying to eliminate any foods from their diet. This is an example coming from the USDA ChooseMyPlate.gov for general recommendations for a two-year-old male or female. At this point, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so every day, kiddo's gonna wanna have about a thousand calories. It's a little over half of what we're recommending for us big adults. <laughs> we're gonna go for about a cup of fruit, cup of veggies, three ounces of grains, trying to make half those grains whole grains is a good recommendation. About two ounces of protein, and about two, two cups of dairy. And you're gonna try and wanna make those low fat dairy options or calcium options if you can. And of course, trying to limit sodium, saturated fat, added sugars, those general guidelines. A two to three year old active male is going to require pretty similar recommendations, but not identical. A two to three year old active male will need about 1400 calories a day and pretty similar fruit, veggie, grain, protein, and dairy amounts. And of course, trying to limit those sugars and saturated fat and sodium as you go. And a two to three year old active female will require again, pretty similar amounts, not identical, somewhat fewer calories throughout the day, about 1200 calories a day. Fruits are again going to be about a cup, cup and a half, four ounces, three ounces, and two and a half cups of dairy trying to limit those sodium saturated fats and sugar. And finally, for about a four to eight year old active male or female, the measurements sort of line up, they're gonna have about, or the recommended amount is going to be about 1400 calories a day, about a cup and a half of fruits, cup and a half of veggies, five ounces of grains, four ounces of protein, two and a half cups of dairy. And we're gonna try and wanna limit those sodium, saturated fats, and sugars. <laughs> and we can have their chance to come back to these if you wanna take closer notes on these. I just wanna be mindful of the time we have. But this is just a sample meal plan. So when we're talking 1400 calories, well, what's in 1400 calories from each of these food groups? These are pretty good examples for what a cup of fruit counts as. It could count as 100% fruit juice. A cup of vegetables could count as 100% vegetable juice with no sugar added. Five ounces of grains could look like one ounce, meaning a slice of whole wheat bread. Four ounces of protein could count as an egg or a tablespoon of peanut butter. So there are lots of different ways that you can get creative about how to add, make sure your kiddo is receiving all of these uh, daily recommended amounts without necessarily saying, oh, well, he needs dairy. Well, then I just need to give him milk. 
Not necessarily. Dairy could come from yogurt, could come from a soy beverage, cheese. There are lots of different ways to include dairy in the kiddo's diet. And so when we're talking about meals and snacks, the number that you want to have per day, children, especially toddlers, need to eat a lot. And I couldn't resist this. This kiddo in the walker on the right has hand side is actually yours truly. <laughs> Parents snapped that picture of me when I was eating green beans and thought it was the funniest thing. So that is me. <laughs> we need to eat quite a lot, obviously. So the recommended serving size, or I, I apologize, the recommended number of meals and snacks you wanna aim for every day, according to Nemours Children Hospital is about three meals and two to three snacks every day. So three meals, and two to three snacks. Tips that kidshealth.org recommends for meals and snacks is actually the following. They recommend regularity is especially key. You wanna schedule snacks and meals at about the same time every day. You wanna avoid snacking to try and pacify, try and avoid snacking to keep them from feeling mad or sad or frustrated or happy. We want to try and keep the regularity as consistent as we can. And if you can, try and eat together. And of course, as we go through all of these recommendations, we at Bluebird understand that there is way more to eating than meets the eye. We like to think of feeding as an iceberg. So when you see this big iceberg, obviously there's way more on top than there is underneath. What we see happening during mealtime or during snack is feeding. But what we don't see are all of the systems that have to coordinate and come together to try and make eating a success. We think about the kiddo's organs. We think about the muscles that are coordinating the muscle that are coordinating with each other and the organs around them to move the food through our GI system. We're thinking about our senses, our sight, hearing, taste, touch. All those things have to be integrated in order for us to be regulated and calm at the table to take in food. We also want to think about our learning and our developmental status. If learning and sitting still is hard for your kiddo, mealtime could be hard as well. We also want to think about their nutrition status going into mealtime. Could they be a little undernourished that day or overnourished to the point where they're not interested in food? Or could they be just at so fatigued that mealtime could be tricky? And of course, you always want to think about their environment, where they're eating, what time, et cetera. I mean, the list really does go on. But these are all examples of things that contribute to a child's ability to eat other than appetite. So now we're going to dive into a woman named Ellen Satter. Who is Ellen Satter? <laughs> Great. Glad you asked. No. <laughs> she is a dietitian a family therapist, author, trainer, publisher, consultant, and parent herself. Ellen Satter create a model that we use at Bluebird Day, including the eating competence model, the feeding dynamics model, and the one that we're going to talk about today, which is the division of responsibilities framework when feeding. And these are just a few books that Ellen Satter has written about these issues here. I always recommend that parents dig into Ellen Satter if you have the time and the ability. These are great books. I highly recommend them. So when we talk about the division of responsibilities model, we're talking about the adult roles versus the child roles at mealtime. So as the adult, you are responsible for three things, what you serve, when you serve it, and what you serve. What, when, and where. Your child is responsible for whether or not they eat and how much. That's it. <laughs> A good way to think of this model is, what are the things that are in my control? And what things are outside of my control? These help create a positive atmosphere at the table and they help you as the parent or caregiver to trust your child to eat when they are ready. 
breaking down the adult and the child roles a little further, as the adult, you can select and prepare the food that you want your child to be eating. You can schedule meals and snacks. You can be good company and create a positive atmosphere. You can model good behavior at mealtime, what you would like them to be doing. You can be considerate to your child without catering, right? We don't want a made to order kitchen here. We want to be considerate of the different texture and tastes that they may have a preference for without necessarily saying, oh, okay, we don't want that. I'll just go back and I'll make you, <laughs> you know, gourmet meals, which I'm sure are wonderful. We always want to encourage water between meals and snacks. We want to reduce the amount of snacking to three meals and two snacks every day. And one of the best quotes I think I've ever heard is let your child grow into the body that is right for him or her. And breaking down the child roles a little more, they can eat the amount that they need, they can watch their adult eat, and they can learn good behavior at mealtime. When we look at tips for the parent's role, what are some things that might help us fulfill these roles at mealtime? Well, we can pair a new food with a preferred food to try and expose them to different foods. We can show new food in very small quantities. I mean, really, like the smaller, the better. One tablespoon of new food is a fabulous place to start for some kiddos. You can offer new food in variety and food that you enjoy. You know, think about the food that you like eating. If you are not a fan of grilled calamari, grilled cheese sandwiches, <laughs> then I would not recommend you expect your child to eat that if you would not eat that. And we think of when, again, Ellen Satter really wants us to present three meals and two snacks every day at routine times. We want to avoid grazing except for water. And when you think about where you're serving the food, pick a table that's a good height for your kiddo and always try to be good company with them. It's a great opportunity for parents to bond. If your kiddo is ready to join you at the table, great. If not, there are ways we can include them at mealtime that doesn't have to include sitting with you. And looking at tips for the child's role. Obviously we have a kiddo here who is thoroughly enjoying her piece of bread and is leaving out the crusts. And that's okay, really, that's fine. You can let your child serve themselves. This is a great opportunity for them to practice their scooping, their pouring, their dumping skills. You can let them eat in any order they want. If it's bread first, if it's rice first, if it's dessert first, wonderful. Whatever order they would like, go for it. See if it works. And their appetites do fluctuate quite a bit, especially at this age. So when their appetites are fluctuating as much as they are, it's important to remember that they might not eat as much today as they did yesterday or this week as they did last week. But it's okay to give them as many servings as they'd like, except for dessert. That's the one area where Ellen Satter does recommend one serving and then we're done. <laughs> Oops, sorry about that. The goal is trusting your child to eat, which can be so hard. <laughs> so, so hard. The goal is preserving your child's sensation of hunger and appetite and satiety. We want them to feel confident at the table and confident in their meal choices. We don't want them to be ashamed of the amount they're eating or the type of food that they're choosing. So I have thrown all of these recommendations and all of these tips and guidelines for you. But when you're thinking about your bluebird in particular, what in the heck does that mean for them? <laughs> and it is important to know that especially for our bluebirds, the responsibilities may change depending on your child's engagement and developmental level at the table. Remembering that feeding is absolutely an iceberg and our little bluebirds have a lot going on where mealtime might be a little, a little more challenging for them than their peers and that's okay. As Bluebird Day caregivers, we can go a little farther into what we're serving our kiddos. When we think about what, going back to that being considerate without catering aspect, this is a great way to include your child at mealtime, even if they're not ready to eat. Because eating, as we know, is a ladder. It starts 
all the way down here at tolerating, being able to be in a room with a new food. That in and of itself can be a really huge step forward for a lot of kiddos. It goes up to interacting with a new food, maybe playing with a utensil or playing with their fingers, going up to smelling it, being okay with it being near their face, going to touching it, being okay manipulating it with their hands and their fingers, maybe all the way up to their arms. There's a way to taste new food. You can kiss it, you can lick it. And finally, being okay with chewing it, swallowing it, and consuming a full serving size. A great way to play with what you're serving is try considering a food chain, as you can see down on the right-hand corner. For example, this kiddo here, really, the parent really wants them to be eating fruit. So when we think about they love potato chips, we start all the way up here. We love potato chips, right? Well, how can we go from potato chips to a banana? Well, we think about potato chips, they're really crunchy and they're a little salty and they're yellow. So what's something that has similar characteristics but isn't exactly the same? Banana chips. We could try going from potato chips to banana chips. And if we like that, we can go from banana chips to something that's a similar consistency, maybe frozen banana, something that's still a little crunchy, something that the kiddo can manipulate in their mouth that's the same size as the banana chips up here, but a little different. And then slowly as we get more comfortable with frozen banana, we can nibble our way onto a whole banana, maybe sliced or whole. These are some different ways that your kiddo can explore different types of food at the table. And if you need any recommendations, feel free to reach out to your therapy team. Our occupational therapists and myself and your speech therapists are all equipped to understand the types of food that your kiddo may benefit from. And when we look at when, sometimes kiddos have a really hard time understanding when the food is coming. If we're at that point where you're thinking, I really would like a regular mealtime routine, but my kiddo just will not budge on, they're just so persistent on, but I want snack now. It could be potentially because we're having a hard time understanding that snack is coming, it's just not coming right now. So a good thing that we like to use are visual schedules. We have a couple examples down here. Breakfast is coming. First, wake up, make bed, get dressed, then breakfast. Or, oh, first we play in circle time and then we eat a snack. Visual timers, as the one seen down here, are great ways to show your kiddo snack is coming in 15 minutes. We have to wait. <laughs> Our speech therapists are excellent resources for you to use as well on different visual schedules, visual, visuals that your kiddo may enjoy, and different visual timers that you may be able to include in your home. And finally, when we're thinking about the where, where are we serving our food? Positioning at mealtime is a really critical piece to help support your kiddo, make them feel safe, keep them regulated, and keep them seated. What we want to aim for is a kiddo right over here at the dining room table. He is seated at a 90 degree angle with his back straight and his legs flush against a seated surface, and his feet down here are supported by a little chair. It doesn't have to get fancy. There's no need sometimes to order a very fancy um, high chair off of Amazon or you know anything like that. It could just be a little chair underneath, phone book on the bottom, and up we go. <laughs> and if you have a small art table, these are great places to encourage snack consumption because most of the work is done for you, right? Their feet are flush against the floor, their backs are straight, and they're at a comfortable position where they can interact with the food without having to worry about where their body is in space and time. And if you're thinking of ways to encourage your kiddos um, attention at the table, these are great options to the right over here. Placemats are wonderful. These plates down here are called easy peasy mats. <laughs> I love them. You can separate the kiddos food and allow them to move it around the plate. Visual timers are another great way to encourage seated positions at mealtime because your kiddo is engaged in something at the table, gives them something to look at while still consuming their food. 
And one of my personal favorites, mirrors. I love mirrors at the table because who doesn't like to watch themselves eat? <laughs> All right, maybe not you, but, <laughs> but encouraging your kiddo to watch themselves eat, especially kiddos who are having a hard time figuring out how to chew and swallow. They can watch the food in their mouth. You can encourage them move it from this side to this side. You can show them really exaggerated bites, the ar, 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 really trying to get that food into their mouth and swallowed completely. And again, if any of these are jumping out to you, feel free to make note of them, send me a chat and always reach out to your Bluebird Day therapy team. We would love to talk to you about mealtime and different things that we could offer you to help support you in your home. So now we're gonna wrap up a little bit and think about this coming from your little Bluebird Day nest. If you had any mealtime challenges coming in today, I encourage you to list them in the chat box. What are your top three mealtime challenges? What type of food does your child react to? Can you think of a different, of a specific texture or a specific taste that you find that they're just really avoiding? When and where are these problems taking place? Do you feel like they're happening at the table, sort of around mealtime? Could it be around snack? Could they be getting hungry potentially between when they uh, have dinner and when they wake up? What are ways that we could think outside the box and maybe try to problem solve from a perspective that doesn't necessarily come from eating the food? And does your child require additional support at the table? Feel free to reach out anytime. So we're gonna go through and review a few learning objectives. If we can think in our heads or list them in the chat box, can you list some adult versus child responsibilities at mealtime? You can think to yourself or you can add them in the chat. I'll give us about a couple more seconds to reply. Awesome, I'm seeing a few chats here. Thank you, keep them coming. Awesome. And if we can think to ourselves, how many meals and snacks are we recommending every day? That's three meals and two snacks a day. Five is the magic number. <laughs> and finally, when we think of factors that influence feeding that don't necessarily relate to appetite, we try to think of body systems. Are our organs all communicating with each other? Is kiddo getting overwhelmed by the smell in front of them or the sight of a new food or the sound of a new food in their mouth or the smell? Are we getting overwhelmed? Those are a few things that I would like, I would encourage you to look at moving forward. Here are a few of the sources that I have listed here. I'm happy to send these out in an email if you would like a reading list. And now I will be happy to take questions and concerns and any comments or feedback. And I invite you to send me an email if you are interested in nutrition services and potentially looking for information on ways Bluebird can help your kiddo be successful at mealtime. If anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat below. Okay. I see one question, grandparents feeding toddler. I can't get them to stop. I think they're showing love. Yes. Oh yes, absolutely. And okay, we have another one. At daycare, my son eats on his own for breakfast sometimes. Great, the process. But dinner is over when grandparents take over. And yes, I can share the slide for a two-year-old daily requirement again, absolutely. These are wonderful questions and this can be tricky as well. If we have an additional caregiver in the house whose mealtime priorities might not necessarily line up with ours, this is a great opportunity to connect regarding this is what I would like to see at mealtime. This is what I see happening. 
what's a way we can rework this? Because grandparents, of course, they show love. Yes, they feed, they feed because that's how they show love. And that's a very valid way of showing love. But of course, if you feel like overfeeding could be contributing to mealtime challenges, that's, some, that's a valid concern. And I would absolutely encourage you to bring that up with the grandparents. Yeah, and of course, schedules can get in the way of consuming a nice breakfast in the morning. And that can be tricky. Oh, I'm glad feeding therapy almost a year ago. And this is a great add on. Oh, I'm so happy. Thank you. Thank you for coming. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate to email me. <laughs> Thank you all, this was wonderful. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to the slide for two-year-old daily requirements. All right, please keep them coming. Your question's coming. For a two-year-old, yes, male or female, here we go. All right. I'm gonna exit out of my full screen here so I can do a quick time check. Okay, perfect. Of course, thank you. To the first slide. Give it just a few more minutes. And then if anyone has any other questions, feel free to email me. But overall, that's that's all I had for you. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending. We have a lot more caregiver education training series coming up soon. I'm so glad. Thank you. Reach out anytime. We have a few more caregiver education series coming up. Uh, please keep an eye out in our calendar for those. And again, feel free to email anytime and reach out to your therapy team if you feel like you have some questions or concerns about kiddos mealtime. There are a lot of great ideas that you can feel free to incorporate into your routine now. Of course, if you feel like there's ever an issue, please take them to your pediatrician. <laughs> Make sure your pediatrician is aware of any diet changes you're making, any changes to mealtime that you're seeing, just to keep everybody on the same page. Alrighty, I am going to sh stop sharing my screen here. There we go. Alrighty, I believe that is everything we had for today. We ended a little early, but I'm sure you guys are very busy and you've got to get through this rainy night. So thank you all so very much for coming. I am glad we were able to connect a little bit. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to your therapy team, and I hope you all have a fantastic evening and happy mealtimes. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. <laughs>